active moms are going to have more active infants because they're going to use their infants in their activity. But there's definitely a lot of research time and time again. And in the last five years, a lot of guidelines have been released all over the world uh, discussing the Im impact and the importance of exercise during pregnancy on maternal, not, not only the mom's health, but also, in, also infant growth and development. So, yeah, it's definitely an, a, a huge critical role. And if we could even prescribe one thing for pregnant people, it's move. Hi and welcome to another episode of Exercise Inside Out. This is the 14th uh, episode and it's packed full of, uh, of um, specials. First up, I got the first international guest, which is Stephanie Paplinski. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Um, let's <laughs> welcome you to the first, uh, the first international episode, the first English one as well. So we got this. And um, yeah, it's the first session for those of you who are watching us uh, right now. The first session to record outside. Uh, I brought all the equipment with me and yeah, let's see how it gets. I think um, the rain is about to start, but we hopefully stay dry and yeah, have a nice chat. So I'm a lot of firsts today. A lot of firsts, This yeah. is great. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, this is very good. If, if anything happens, let's, we're just going to go with the flow. Yes, of course. Love it. Um, I'm really looking forward, um, especially to talk with you, because I really like to uh, talking with you. Um, but I think the topic for today is really, really awesome, because we will talk about uh, pregnancy and exercise, how it is related. And um, I think we will have a chat about several different things, like what are exercise recommendations for women that experience pregnancy beforehand, during pregnancy and afterwards. Yeah. Um, second of all, um, what are the effects? of moms and their infants. How does exercise relate to that? Um, then third question could be like, how can I readjust or modify typical gym exercises um, in the sense of pregnancy mm -hmm. or in terms of pregnancy? And maybe we end up with some future directions for upcoming research or your topics and so on, yeah. because you are definitely an expert in the field. And yeah, <laughs> let's see um, um, yeah, what we will talk about there. Great, yeah. I love all of those topics, so this is going to be good. How long do we have? Um, I, I don't have like a, a strict structure, but I usually... So the, the average um, episode in Exercise Inside Out is like um, 80 minutes. Okay, So perfect. we have like an hour, okay. and if we have one hour and a half, it's totally, Great. totally fine. I think and, and if you are talking, it's yeah. like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can definitely have like <laughs> part three. <laughs> yeah. Good now. It, but... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but before we come to all these crazy topics and the content, I think the audience deserves to first of all um, get to know you first. Yes. So um, I usually have like a certain category. I called it Speed Meet. Okay. And there are 10 questions, short questions, just to to get to know you. Something might be related to the topic. Mm -hmm. Some things are just kind of random, mm -hmm. but hopefully they will get some idea. Um, how you are and uh, what Perfect. <laughs> your experience. Fire away. Okay, <laughs> let's let's do it. Okay, first up, hot or cold? Ah, uh, cold. Cold. Tea or coffee? Coffee. What's your favorite emoji? Oh, I use the explosion one all the time. The, with the head one? No, no, like the... Like Just the, the, the Yeah, the explosion or the bomb. Okay. All the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Craft beer or kölsch? Ooh, Kelsch. Really? Yeah, you can't get good Kelsch in Canada. So, yeah, I just drink that when I'm here, like water. Okay. Um, then something that's related to CrossFit, Matt Fraser or uh, Rich Froning Jr.? Ooh, Matt Fraser. Why? I have just followed his whole career. So I, I just, I think I resonate with Matt. But uh, Justin Medeiros, he's, he's someone that I'm keeping an eye on now. Okay. Yeah. And not just he's more handsome or so just for uh, performance related i mean he's just so impressive like matt fraser he, he, he's unstoppable i mean if he didn't retire he would probably keep winning you know he's just that good okay yeah nice uh what's your secret superpower 
Ooh, my voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's is it really secret? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's the first thing you know you notice about you. Yeah, it's like where, where's Steph on campus? If you just close your eyes, you'll you'll hear her. You'll hear. Her. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, MRAP or Imam? Ooh, I like AMRAPs, but with clients, I usually prescribe a lot of Imams as well. Okay, and if you have to decide. Ah, uh, Amrap. Amrap. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite character in The Lion King? Oh, I love Simba. Yeah. Oh, he's great. Yeah, that, that's the one. That's my favorite movie, actually. Yeah, I, I, I cry every time. Yeah, I, I, I prepared. I had not much time to to prepare, but I had some of your podcast episodes, <laughs> and since The Lion King was my first um, movie, I watched. Um, um, in, in cinema, yeah, but also in uh, on on video yeah. on VHR, yeah, or VHS, and yeah. so on. Yeah, so this is why I had to to bring one of the questions. Yeah, uh, it's the uh, best. Okay, barbell or dumbbell? Dumbbell. Okay, and prenatal or postpartum? Ah, uh, postpartum. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why postpartum? That's the majority of the clients that I work with and also that's the focus of my research. So I, I really enjoy helping women get from delivery back into their sport or their exercise during that postpartum period, that six to 12 or sometimes 18 month time frame. So that's like my specialization for sure. Um, prenatal is great, but with prenatal, in my opinion, Uh, it's it's very easy for me to adjust and adapt exercises for my clients because I've been doing it so long. The thing about prenatal is there's a lot more health concerns as well. So you have a little bit more freedom postpartum that uh, you don't really, you have to be a lot more cautious prenatal. Okay, so yeah. this is why postpartum is like, let's go and it's we're, more... We're ready now. We're ready to get you back. So let's okay. let's do that safely. And I know how to do that too. And, and probably less like insecurities. I, I could... I'm, I'm obviously not a <laughs> I can't be a mom <laughs> anytime. Maybe one day. Maybe one <laughs> <Who knows>? day. <laughs> I think science With can science, do anything. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> science could make it. But I could imagine that, um, yeah, having like this prenatal phase uh, uh, is fa it's, uh, combined with a lot of, or can be combined with some insecurities like what is good, what is too much, can I do this exercise, is it helpful for the infant or not, which we will definitely talk about mm -hmm. in... Uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes, but um, yeah. yeah, everyone's more cautious, cautious. And uh, even when I started this research and looking into exercise during and pregnancy, when I first started in the fitness industry, there wasn't a lot of information and there wasn't specific exercises like, oh, you shouldn't do this or you should do this and why or why not. And I think that confusion and that gap really can can make people nervous and then most people will err on the side of caution which is great but with the literature and, and what we know now in the research like women can push themselves a little bit during pregnancy and it's okay and it's and it's good for them so it, it's really getting the education piece out about that and there were no exercise guidelines for pregnant people until the like 86 like mid 80s so prior to that, most people were told to rest and relax and, oh, you're eating for two. So, you know, <laughs> you need to you need to eat lots. And we realized that all of that is terrible advice. <laughs> and then you think about, you know, obesity and kind of the chronic diseases we're dealing with now in older adults and even in, you know, people in their, their mid 20s, 30s, 40s. It's happening a lot earlier. And other than, you know, lifestyle factors And other than our diets uh, now and our access to, you know, healthy versus unhealthy food, I think a lot of the, the problems we're seeing now with our health, it, it's come from what's happened during pregnancy. So we can definitely right from the beginning say that, that pregnancy is like a, it's related to a lot of different systems in the body and yeah. it has, it is like, like a, Oh, you, you used to say that it's like a, a, a really big competition, like the world championships of uh, motherhood, you could say. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, you and have it, to prepare for it, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it would be, I just thought of a kind of a research question now that we're sitting here, but it would be cur I'd be curious to interview every student that it gets accepted here at the university. 
and ask them what their parents are like. Ask them were their moms active during their pregnancy. And seeing what that statistic is, maybe compared to people who either don't get into the university or attend other universities, you know, um, because it plays such a, such a critical role during development. So, um, are there any um, um, is there any evidence um, that like the activity of moms during exercise is related to the yeah frequency of of physical activity uh, in the later stages of, of childhood? Or is it just like a, a guess? Uh, it, well, I mean, active moms are going to have more active infants because they're going to use their infants in their activity. But there's definitely a lot of research time and time again. And in the last five years, a lot of guidelines have been released all over the world uh, discussing the Im impact and the importance of exercise during pregnancy on maternal, not, not only mom's health, but also, in, also infant growth and development. So, yeah, it's definitely an, a, a huge critical role. And if we could even prescribe one thing for pregnant people, it's move, like exercise. Even if you're on bed rest, you can still do like lightweight exercises and aerobics with your arms and smaller muscle groups in bed, which a lot of people don't know. So I've had friends who are very active during their life, they get pregnant, they're put on bed rest for whatever health condition or reason. And then they're so depressed about it. But I, I tell them, you know, you can still do exercises in, in your room. Yes, you can't do the same things that maybe you want to do at this time, but this is a time that we're thinking about growing a human and you're going to have the rest of your life to do all the other things that you want to do. So let's modify, let's adapt, let's still keep you moving. Uh, and walking's a great option. People forget about walking, but walking is one of the best forms of exercise or activity you can do. Even cycling. You do a lot of research with hand cycling. <laughs> I bring it up all the time. I'm like, I know people who are professional hand cyclists. Like you can still get that uh, like stimulus and that response and the benefits with a variety of activities. It just doesn't have to be weightlifting or CrossFit or running or you know, those kinds of activities. Or the the high, the intensity I used to do beforehand and like, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but before we come to all the nitty gritty details yeah. of uh, recommendations and the science and your topics, um, I would just like to, um, to share what I know about you. Yeah. And since we haven't seen each other for like two years, three years, five years. <laughs> um, it's, it's been three and a half. It, th it's been, it's okay. 2019. That was yeah. the last time I was here. I was here in the summer and then yeah. November. In then November. Yeah. Um, because we actually met at the Science Slam World Cup that was uh, here at the German Sport University. Yeah. Where this was my first time uh, science slamming. Same. And we had actually we attended in the same slam here uh, in the in our um, great lecture room. Yeah. In the Hörsaal 1. Uh, and it, I think it was in November 2018. Yep. I just, okay, like yeah. almost uh, five years uh, yeah. now. It's crazy. <laughs> um, I know that you have been an Erasmus student yep. in 2010, yep. if I'm correct. Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. And since then, I think you more you know more uh, people here at the German <laughs> Sport University than someone, some uh, people that work here for like several years. So you're, yeah. you're really like outgoing and like, hey, <laughs> what's your research? Yeah. Um, It's funny, too, now, because now people that I knew as friends are, and like yourself, now your lectures are working up the professor ladder, which is really cool to see. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, she's here for, for one week, and she has, like, workout with, with a lot of, of people. Every with day. Jerry, yeah. Jens, and so on. Yeah. Every so. day we do something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think if, if we take a look at you, we know that you are quite fit. And you have um, been competing in bodybuilding yeah, in 2012. I, I saw some of your pictures. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <That's> thank you. <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Is there, um, I, I know I'm not that really into bodybuilding. I'm more the endurance type of um, yeah. athlete. But this, um, um, the, the, the competition um, classes are like the um, men's physique, classic physique, and then the, the open class. Mm -hmm. Is it similar in the female? The yeah, females? there's a lot of classes in the female uh, bodybuilding world. And actually, female bodybuilding is no longer a category. So they replaced that with women's physique in 2011, 2012, somewhere around that time frame. 
Um, and actually, that was with a topic of my master's thesis. I studied um, sport philosophy and ethics, and I looked at uh, the ethical issues around uh, female bodybuilders and the stereotypes around female bodybuilders compared to, say, male bodybuilders or even other categories of female competitors. So when I was uh, doing my master's, I was competing, and I actually used my own experiences to inform my research uh, using a methodology called autoethnography. So the things that I was experiencing during my training, uh, the thoughts that I had, uh, I would then use that to do some research in exercise science, psychology, uh, fitness training for women, and then I, I started to build my master's around that. And what I realized at the end of my master's, I, after I had written my dissertation, uh, I didn't want to participate in bodybuilding and fitness shows anymore. Uh, to me, it's, it's very superficial. It's also, um, it's very subjective and objective and in some ways, but I then decided I was going to switch over to more performance-based uh, sports and outcomes. So that's why I ended up switching to CrossFit. Um, I've done bodybuilding, but I've also done powerlifting. Uh, I do, I've done a sprint triathlon. I have to admit, I don't love long distances. Like I like my five to 10 K runs, my bike rides. I'll, I've done like a hundred K in a day and I love that, but swimming's my weakness. So I've decided when I get older, I'm going to take up swimming. I was talking to Jens about this yesterday because he took me swimming okay. and I, I said, it's not my strength. I'll get better. But my plan is to start swimming more in my late 30s, early 40s. Once, uh, once my knees, if, if they wear out or once my health kind of doesn't allow me to do some of the higher intensity stuff that I'm doing now, then I'm going to switch to those things for myself. But I think for, for the work with, uh, with your clients, I think having like a great variety of different sports and participation mm -hmm. is like really a, a benefit. So if you just like this... If you were like like a, like a CrossFit girl, like this is this is what sport is, yeah, and it's the only way. I think it's quite difficult, and I can imagine that um, being a bodybuilder as a female can be like really difficult because some like pictures of how women should look like, and if they are yeah, if they have more mass or more power or more strength than than men, that they might feel like. This, I don't like this. Um, have you experienced this as well? No, my well, I've seen it in other people, but my parents, because I grew up on a farm and I have a huge family, we always helped around the, the farm with, with all the work that needed to be done. I worked for my dad's construction company growing up, so I always had muscle, like I was always very strong. I always performed very well in like shot put, the track sports, but I could also do long distance running as a kid and do very well at that. So I was very a well rounded athlete, but my parents encouraged us to be involved in many sports. Uh, they encouraged us be, to be strong and fit um, because it was needed for the farm, but also that's how they are. So they're very active in that regard. And I think. Yeah, there is a stereotype around, you know, oh, I don't want to get too big. But that's, that's I think, a very social pressure, right, and a societal pressure. And I think it's interesting because we're talking about this and we're in Europe, but it's the same in North America. And I hear it's the same, you know, in South America. Like, wherever you go in the world, there are these societal stereotypes where women should be smaller or take up less space. Men are allowed to be bigger and stronger. And I, I see that changing because it, it becomes more of like, well, what can you do? You can be big and strong like bodybuilders, but they can't really run very far, <laughs> you know, like, and over time their health really deteriorates fast. So with my clients, especially during their pregnancies, even if they've never lifted uh, or if they're not really uh, frequently exercising, I tend to put them more on a, on a strength training protocol. And we do cardio, but it's mixed into the protocol itself because I said you can go for a walk on your own. You don't need me there to watch you walk. But then during uh, the postpartum period, my, because I have a background, I've done Pilates, I've done yoga, gymnastics, uh, strength training, CrossFit, uh, and I, my clientele tends to be very um, higher income, higher education, very motivated. Over the, the course of my programs, we're doing a lot of different stuff. So it's definitely not just one thing. Every class we're doing some sort of Pilates core exercise. We use yoga. But a lot of it is based around strength training 
And during the postpartum period with my clients and um, even in my research, we did a lot of like, okay, fat loss for women. Uh, how can we improve fat loss? And especially during this time when there's a lot of hormonal changes and breastfeeding and all these other factors, lack of sleep uh, that you can't control. So there's, there is some research out there in the strength and conditioning field uh, on that. And so I took that to kind of inform the uh, protocol for my research, but also it with my clientele. Uh, I've been doing this now, working in this industry for 13, 14 years. And my, my clients usually tell me by the end of the, we have a maternity leave in Canada, so women can take anywhere from six to 18 months off paid. And my, the best feedback I get from my clients is that I feel more fit than I've ever felt, or I feel more fit than even before I was pregnant, and now I'm going back to work. And I'm like, that's, that's exactly how I want everyone to feel. Great. I think um, for me as a, as a podcast host, uh, which is called... <laughs> um, I think I, <laughs> I really want to, come, to combine like, these two perspectives. <laughs> yeah. And I think you are a great example of how to um, translate like, the, the science into practice mm -hmm. so that they are both uh, combined. And I haven't introduced the name of your business. We talked about your clients and what yeah. you do with them. It's called, I think I really love the name. Yeah. Uh, it's called Strong Her Fitness, yeah. written with a capital H, yeah. uh, to pronounce that you work with women. Yeah. Uh, do you, can you just elaborate what you do um, or what your, um, what your mission is? What is your, what is your goal for your business? Yeah, so I started the, the, my company, Stronger Fitness, in uh, 2013. It was just after my master's program. I moved to a different city and I wanted to work. And so uh, it was just going to kickstart that. So my website was up and then I started specifically training women uh, across all categories. But I was doing prenatal and postpartum in London, where I work now at Western University. Uh, but when I moved, I needed clients. And so my decision was just to train all types of women, uh, older, younger, doesn't matter. And then I ended up moving back to London a year later. And so I continued my business there. And basically, uh, I only work with prenatal postpartum. However, now I've been transitioning into premenopause and menopause because a lot of the things that we see during pregnancy and after pregnancy, if they're not addressed, especially with pelvic floor health, any injuries, they come back in menopause. So now I've been working with a lot of older women, just uh, strength training, getting their pelvic floor education, working with physiotherapists, things like that. But yeah, um, I just my goal is to empower women to live the most active, healthy pregnancies they can. And my kind of tagline is uh, stronger for birth, stronger for baby, stronger for life. And so this is a really unique time in a person's life where they're often, if they've smoked or they drink a lot, they stop that during pregnancy, right? Like the health of their baby becomes the primary and Hopefully utmost. Hopefully they stop. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it, it really does that. People make very quick lifestyle changes overnight when they find out they're pregnant. And so we, I use this as an opportunity to also teach women about the benefits of exercise and activity, not only now, but in the future as well. And specifically, like I tell my clients, if you want to know why I have all these exercises in this order across these programs, I can justify every single exercise I give you because I think about it that much. Every program is specifically designed for every stage of pregnancy and it's periodized because I'm a strength and conditioning coach. So it's never just random. There's a, a purpose for every exercise as, as we move along the way. And then it just becomes, depending on how fit they are, where they're at in their postpartum journey, I usually give three exercises per kind of, op as options, so that you can pick, if this is your first time doing it, you can pick the option one. If it's your second time, option two, three, and so forth. So uh, I really do, it's, it's, it's kind of like a cookie cutter program that's customized to you. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's been my passion and I love it. I love my clients. It's, everyone's so happy because they just have a baby, but it also, it gives them a sense of community because when you're alone, especially during COVID, moms felt so isolated, right? You can't go outside. You feel bad to hang out with other people. You're also thinking about how this might impact your infant. Are they going to get sick? So now with kind of COVID behind us, uh, it's just been really great. And, uh, and being able to facilitate that community and that connection for these women is amazing. And we all become friends. Like all of my stroller moms over the years, they're still friends. They stay in touch. 
they still hang out. And like that to me is just, it's awesome to hear those stories. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the audience um, that uh, is hearing you really um, gets the, the enthusiasm you have for this, um, for this yeah, topic and for this, this yeah. lifestyle. And you are almost done with your studies. Uh, yep. You just told me yesterday uh, at the Mensa yes. <laughs> um, that you are about to um, submit your PhD thesis this yep. year, yep. Uh, which is great. Yep. Um, let me see. So if end, I... end of next month, it, it will be rough copy, totally submitted. And then I'll just have revisions and I'll be defending in the fall. Finally. Yep. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And I mean, it's, it sucks because COVID did really impact our research. We weren't able to see uh, people in the lab. And then on campus, you couldn't, you couldn't come to campus unless you were vaccinated. Infants can't be, weren't vaccinated at the time. There was no safety around that. So it basically it's halted our entire uh, lab and all of our research. And we're now finally picking it back up. But our lab has not seen many people walking through it and many subjects since prior to COVID, unfortunately. Uh, if you just um, think back um, about this this topic, because it's almost ended, uh, at least the, the studies uh, mm -hmm. part of things, um, why did you choose to use to do this topic and what was the Uh, what was the idea of it? Could, I, I think you have explained this in, in other podcasts, but just for, uh, for my audience, can you just tell, like, how did it come that you found, fell in love with the topic uh, pregnancy and exercise? Yeah, it was an accident. <laughs> it was As an always. It was, an it, was, it was a series of happy accidents. <laughs> so I was, I originally, my foot in the, the door in the fitness world was as an aquafit instructor. So when I came to university, they had just built a brand new exercise and fitness complex and they, they have an Olympic sized swimming pool and they were hiring aquafit instructors for their fitness classes. And all my friends were doing uh, group fitness, land fitness, personal training. And so my thought was, well, if they're doing all that, there's not going to be as many clients available. There's not gonna be as many opportunities. I'm gonna have to work harder. So I said, well, I'll teach aquafit. So I went and became certified a couple weeks later. And then I realized that there's not many certified aqua fitness instructors, <laughs> period. So I was teaching and one of my friends, she had been teaching a prenatal class for a while. It was the summertime and she wanted to go on holidays. And so she asked if I would take over her class. And so I taught her class for a couple of weeks while she was away, loved it. But even going into the class, I said, I've never taught a class for pregnant people. I don't know what exercises I can do. So I walk into who's my now supervisor, Dr. Michelle Matola. I knocked on her door in her office and I said, hi, Dr. Matola, you don't know me, but uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm a second year undergraduate student and I have to teach a prenatal aquafit class. Do you have any advice? Like, are there any resources? And then her response was, well, have you read the guidelines for exercise during and after pregnancy? And I said, no, no, I have. <laughs> She's, but I published it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll be working on it one day. Okay. No, yeah. So she said, go there first. And so I went and read it and I said, okay, heart rate, water aerobics is good, but I still can't find a class outline anywhere. I don't know which exercises are safe to do, which ones are not. So that was a learning curve. And I mean, luckily I can use common sense. And then uh, after a while, um, my friend eventually left that position and the, the, the business she was working for. And then they offered me the position as aquafit instructor, but then they also said, if you want to teach land fitness, like um, prenatal fitness or mom and baby stroller boot camp, we've got openings available for that. So I shadowed one class with another trainer and then I started. And so I've been working since my second year undergrad, which was like, oh, this is going to date me back, but like 2008 uh, with this population. And then as I progressed in my studies, um, and then into my master's, my master's, I did philosophy and sport ethics, but then I also did a minor in coaching and strength and conditioning. So I was working with all of the varsity athletes and I was learning about like all of the best techniques for training, speed, power performance. But what I noticed is many of the athletes had very weak cores, like their core and abdominal strength was not uh, conducive to maybe their overall strength. So we did a lot of core training. And then I started to realize, oh, I can use these principles with my clients who have just had babies because their cores are weak. They've been, you know, stretched. Their physiology has changed. Some of them have experienced some sort of injury um, that now that it's impacting their ability to exercise. So I really was able to take everything that I was learning with working with varsity football players, basketball players, hockey players, 
men and women, and then apply it and translate it to my population. And I think that's something with research that we don't often think about. You mentioned knowledge translation, and it's so important um, because when I went back to do my PhD, I'd taken three years off. I was on a wait list to be uh, accepted into the lab because my super had so, uh, supervisor had so many students. But I said, I don't want to go back to school and do a, a PhD in something that I don't care about. If I'm going to go back, I want to make sure it's something I'm interested in, it's something that I feel like I can contribute to the literature about, and it's something that's going to help people. That we can take this information and we can translate it and people will benefit from it. Because the majority of people that would benefit from the research that's being conducted here are never going to read it, right? They, they rely on their coaches or their doctors or the physiotherapists to read it. But academic literature can be difficult to interpret. And so uh, part of that now is the knowledge translation. And I think you're doing a wonderful job with a podcast. That's such a great, it's such a great avenue where you can reach so many people and you can get information out that would otherwise kind of be locked behind the confines of the university. Yeah. Right? I, I just got a, a, a really, really great like uh, session of one of my colleagues. He's called Dr. Christoph Bertling. And he did a, a class um, on how to translate science into practice or how to um, yeah, really um, tell a, an audience that is not involved into science and does not know the difference between an impact factor or an age value for, for journals and so on. Um, and he pointed out that for a scientific talk, we actually don't care about the relevance because we, we think this is definitely important. And we forget about the, the, the relevance for, for a public audience. Mm -hmm. And I think I, what he really emphasized is that for another audience, um, it's important to, to get the relevance first. So what is the benefit for reading the different studies? What, what, is, what is your personal benefit? So that you, for example, um, you know what you can do, you reduce insecurities, you can help your health the health of your infant for example and even if you say like but i'm not pregnant and i'm not going to be pregnant why should i care <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like i think it can translate to other fields as well yeah and maybe it, i actually i accidentally fell in love with um, um paracycling as mm. well and i i did not know that this is about to come and for for this topic I think it's basically the same. So I think um, now is a good time to really tell the audience about the, the, the recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, for the preparation, I found the, the article you always uh, cite or always mention of your um, supervisor, mm -hmm. uh, Michel Matola, which is published quite heavily in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which is like the, one of the greatest sports science journals out there in yeah. 2019. And um, there she published the 2019 Canadian guidelines yep. for physical activity throughout pregnancy. Yep. Um, when I read them, there were like six bullet points. Yeah. You can definitely elaborate this uh, even more. But when I read them, I was like, they are pretty similar to the general uh, WHO guidelines, mm. like 150 minutes of exercise each yeah. week, yeah. Uh, three sessions each, each week, mm. having a... Um, like a, a mixture between strength and endurance type mm. of sports. There was, for me personally, the only yeah, special thing was these, um, if you feel like a little nausea, if you are lying on your belly, mm -hmm. then maybe you can avoid this and do other exercises. But um, yeah, what are the, the recommendations? And uh, would you say that they are pretty similar to the general population guidelines? Yeah, and that that's a very good point. The guidelines themselves of the 150 minutes of light to moderate, ideally moderate intensity activity, that really hasn't changed across the board. But how you accomplish that is is what a lot of people don't understand. And so, you know, if you're a doctor and you have your script and you're writing, writing your recommendation, uh, we want people to work up to 150 minutes or more. More is more is better. Um, up to uh, you know 15 minute bouts ideally 10 minutes or more 30 minutes a day if possible daily activity is encouraged 
And then if someone's never exercised before, you start them at a lighter intensity and we gradually build up that intensity over the weeks. And in the lab, when we work with our prenatal uh, subjects, they uh, start at, I believe, 20 minutes and each week we add two minutes to their walking protocol. So something like that is just an easy way to increase the intensity. Um, but yes, you want to do a combination of different activities. So resistance training, cardiovascular training, both have benefits. When you look at uh, diabetes research just in general, there's something, there's a, there's a factor about resistance training that elicits a, be- like a, a stimulus with diabetic patients that is better than just cardiovascular training alone. So when someone is diagnosed with diabetes, they'll prescribe resistance training and aerobic or cardiovascular training. And I think the same is true in pregnancy because gestational diabetes is a risk, right? So I think you want to be doing both because there's something about it that helps regulate your, your blood glucose. And I don't know why. A lot of the researchers don't know why. That's a question that they're is still exploring. But uh, with the guidelines themselves, yes, Uh, Another thing that was added recently was the incorporation of pelvic floor exercises and activities. So a lot of people have heard of the word Kegels. Um, It's like a term when you contract your pelvic floor. But realistically, pelvic floor exercises uh, can be breathing exercises. Anything that is utilizing the diaphragm and the pelvic floor and the abdominal musculature and having those units work together. And really, in order to do that safely and to know that you're doing that that effectively, you should be working alongside a pelvic floor physiotherapist. Um, Because there are certain things that I can assess externally, but they can even go into the internal assessments and see if one side of your pelvic floor is tighter than the other. Um, Because if you have what we call a hypertonic pelvic floor, where your pelvic floor is really tight and firing, you could have more problems during delivery, and you could also tear more during delivery. If you have a hypotonic pelvic floor, uh, it might be weak, and so you could also have problems with incontinence and things like that during and after pregnancy. So these are all things that we never really talked about 10 years ago. It's kind of like the last five years, pelvic floor health and pelvic floor rehabilitation and physiotherapy has become important. And I stress it with my clients because, as you know, if you were going to have an uh, like ACL reconstruction surgery or even any sort of surgery, you're working with a physiotherapist prior to that surgery to make sure you're strong enough, to make sure you're moving well going into it. And then immediately after, you're going back to physiotherapy to regain your strength and your muscle uh, tone. And the same thing should be done during pregnancy, but because it's been deemed, oh, it's natural, we've been doing it for centuries, it's like it's, it's ignored. And uh, I know France, it is a standard practice and care that you go see a physiotherapist after you've given birth. Uh, Canada, we're working on that. Uh, the education around pelvic floor health is very minimal, even in the medical schools. So we're trying to change that where in the medical schools, we're teaching students more about pelvic floor, pelvic health, and also how it applies to pregnancy, but also throughout the lifespan. And so that's the biggest thing I say, I would say with knowledge translation right now is educating about the pelvic floor. Um, when it comes to certain, ex- going back to the guidelines, when it comes to certain exercises and activities, uh, avoiding um, like explosive exercises and activities. Uh, so uh, weightlifting and CrossFit are contraindicated later on. Um, I say just the barbell itself Uh, If you're moving with a barbell and you're trying to perform exercises properly, you're going to have to be working around your belly for snatches and cleans. It becomes unsafe. But I say just substitute for dumbbells, right? You can use dumbbells instead. And that's why I chose dumbbells over the barbell. They're more versatile, right? So my clients, (laughs) we use dumbbells, kettlebells. We use barbells too. But by that third trimester, as soon as that belly pops, you're going to have to modify certain exercises. Yeah, uh, exercises on your belly are contraindicated. Most people won't be able to do exercises on their belly between 16 to 18 weeks, sometimes earlier, just depending on if they're feeling pressure. And then on your back is, um, is uh, it, 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 I mean, in the guidelines, it says you can do it, just not for an extended period of time. But if you dive into the research and, and the article specifically, and the study that looked at that, there was a drop in, in heart rate. So, uh, it is one of those things that I mean. I just say if you want to do a bench press, put oop, sorry. No, no if, problem. If you want to put a, if you want to do a bench press, um, you can put your bench like on an incline, and then you're not flat on your back. 
my clients will do like decline glute bridges, incline bench presses. So they're always on some sort of an angle, but no more than 30 seconds. You don't want to do anything intensive. Uh, no breath holding. That's unsafe, right? We want to keep continuous oxygen uh, to the uh, body. But that's difficult for people who are crossfitters or powerlifters or who do heavy strength training because you've been taught to do the Valsalva maneuver. Yeah. And so that we throw out like, nope, no more Valsalva no. maneuver. We don't want that at all. And then when it comes to like impact exercise and activity, yeah, I mean, anything that's going to um, put, have the fall put, potential for falling. And here in Germany, everyone bikes everywhere. But I mean, you could fall off a bike. Most people are fairly safe about it. Um, but we recommend stationary cycling uh, versus, you know, going on long bike rides on rough terrain, uh, horseback riding, scuba diving is contraindicated because the pressure changes. And then also being mindful if you're training at different altitudes as well, that can be uh, problematic. Just that you uh, mentioned like a uh, bike and falling. Just yesterday, I received uh, an email on my working um, German Sport University uh, email address. And it was like, my, your father <laughs> just had an accident, oh. um, which was at the end okay. But with the coordinates, so his uh, Garmin watch, mm -hmm. just, uh, it could be any watch. I'm not affiliated to Garmin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe so if you're watching this. Yeah. No. But it, is, it, it was a, a, this kind of watch. And uh, I was his, like, um, emergency contact. Yeah. And it immediately, due to the, the acceleration, sent me an email with the coordinates I called him and he was like yeah I fell but it's it's kind of okay yeah. and but it was yeah really um, interesting that this whole technique uh, basically works but for example to avoid this uh, kind of thing you could cycle on a cycle ergometer if it's possible to um, not like like a time trial bike mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but uh, rather here um, and what is the the main um, reason for for example for avoiding this kind of breathing maneuver does it translate to the to the blood pressure of the um Uh, of the of the unborn infant or yeah. what is it yeah so blood pressure lightheadedness so then if you pass out you know then you're going to fall potentially hurt yourself but also in particular pelvic floor so when we take a big breath in our diaphragm contracts and actually moves downward our abdominals naturally uh, engage but then our pelvic floor it wants to engage and contract as well when you have a fetus growing in there and you, you know your uterus and everything else that pressure builds up even around there, right? And so uh, from a safety perspective, yeah, we want the oxygen always continually flowing. Again, that's why we avoid long-term uh, bouts on the back during activity. Um, but yeah, blood pressure, but also oxygen flow and then also pelvic floor health. If you're holding your breath, you're more likely to actually have potential incontinence issues and things like that. So yeah, it's just a, it's a safer way. And it also basically helps to regulate how much weight you use. So generally speaking, my clients, if they know their one rep max from the past, they're training usually with 50 to maybe up to 80% of their one rep max. And keep in mind during pregnancy, it's basically like you're walking around with a weighted vest. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you throw on a 35 pound, even your backpack, put 35 pounds of weight in it and just walk around for a bit, it gets heavy. And that's what I do with my students. I'm like, you want to feel pregnant? Let's throw on some backpacks. <laughs> Let's, <do it. laughs> Let's put a medicine ball in there and see what it's like and see what you're able to do and not do. And that's a really good kind of learning experiment for them, because especially as a male. Yeah, you're right. You're probably not going to experience pregnancy, but I guarantee you're going to know someone in your life family member, sister, cousin, friend who's going to become pregnant. And then they're going to have these questions and they're going to come to people who are in the field. So you'll probably get questions too. And you can just say, I just talk to Steph, you know, <laughs> or just share this podcast. Yeah, just share this podcast. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and a lot of the clients that I have now are actually the wives and girlfriends of athletes that I used to train. So, I mean, The education, I think it's always important and, and the knowledge is transferable even to men, to women who are older. It, it all kind of plays a role and I think it's important. Mm -hmm. And um, we just talked about the, the recommendations yep. and um, yeah, the, the, the ideas of why exercise is, is good. I think hopefully all um, the listeners um, now get why it's, why it's good to prepare for, for yep. this kind of thing. 
But um, are there any contraindications um, of for avoiding kind of uh, exercise? Or what would you say? Like, are there from the recommendations? I found like there are absolute contraindications and like relative ones. Could yeah. you just? I mean, there's a huge list, so I definitely recommend checking out the, the 2019 Canadian guidelines. But now, I mean, Australia has released their gu guidelines as well. There's probably been, I think there's eight different guidelines across uh, the world that have been released in the last four years. And prior to that, it was just really the Canadian guidelines that we had. And they weren't as specific as some of the guidelines that have recently been released. But um, contraindications specifically, they're the relative ones, yeah, like if you... Are having a, if you're having twins, you know, you want to be very mindful. If you have an, a health condition, uh, that's something that you should talk to your physician, your primary health care provider about. Uh, some of the main ones that I see in the industry uh, and with my clients is placenta previa. So when your placenta attaches to the uterine lining, sometimes it attaches very low and it can be very close to the cervix. And the danger with that is if you're doing impact exercise or holding your breath and you're having a lot of intra-abdominal pressure or jumping impact exercises, you could potentially um, tear that placental lining and then you could have a, a serious bleed. Uh, so that's a, a major one. But even with that, I've trained a client through her entire pregnancy. She had placenta previa the entire time. We just modify uh, certain exercises, certain body positions, and then the weight. We're not lifting as heavy as we would if she wasn't, if she didn't have placenta previa. Um, and then there's another one. It used to be called incompetent cervix, but now it's called uh, cervical insufficiency. Um, so that's when potentially your cervix lining is very thin and easily ruptured. I actually, my best friend just had this and she just gave birth like two weeks ago early. But um, uh, sometimes they'll have to actually sew your cervix closed a little bit more for support. But if you've had that happen, you're unable to exercise uh, and do a lot of things. Like they don't really want you doing a lot of things uh, upright. So we switch to seated stuff. We go lighter weight. Uh, we do more decline, incline positions on the bench, things like that. Um, and then it becomes more like core and Pilates work, breath work, yoga, things like that, as opposed to uh, strength training. You really want to proceed with caution. And, you, and and that's why it's important also to be knowledgeable or at least connect with their healthcare providers so that there's a constant kind of communication going. So I try to do that with most of my clients, although it's not always possible um, because Uh, obstetricians and gynecologists are very busy people too <laughs> you know so they're like we trust that you know what you're doing you know you're doing your research in this you've got a you're you're a strength and conditioning coach and you're working with one of the best you know I, I have the best supervisor I always say that in the world she's wonderful uh, so we take all those things into consideration but yeah I, I recommend people read the relative uh, contraindications in the absolute Uh, sometimes you can get bleeding or spotting during a, a, an exercise or activity. That's usually a sign just to follow up with your doctor. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop exercising. But even with people who are on bed rest, um, uh, my supervisor in the lab a few years ago, they actually released a bed rest training protocol. So even if you're put on bed rest, there's we have a list of exercises you can still do. So it's definitely worth checking out. Okay. Um, I think it's basically the same as um, in the, like... I think 40s, 50s, there was like this this term if you um, had like a cardiac disease, it was basically the same um, as uh, for, for pregnant um, women. It was like you have to rest, you have to lay down as little exercise as possible. And um, I think it was the, the Cologne Research Group um, and uh, predominantly our or my uh, favorite Uh, former uh, Professor Wilder Holman, I think. Mm -hmm. have you, haven't you have you seen him? Yeah. In a class of him? I have not seen him in class, oh. but I've, I've met him once on campus. Okay, yeah, you, she has met him. <laughs> um, yeah, I think his, his, his uh, classes were like phenomenal. Yeah. He was like in the, the mid or beginning of the 90s of his life and uh, mid 90s, he was like every single event with the date Not, not just the year, but also the date of the event. And um, he actually developed this, this uh, Cologne way of thinking, like if you have a cardiac disease, you have to train. And you have to train especially at a moderate to high intensity, which mm -hmm. is good for the cardiac muscles. And I think actually the same applies to, to, to a pregnancy. Like, no, not just resting. There are some contraindications. You have to read them. 
Uh, when I uh, prepared for this uh, session, which was quite uh, spontaneous, this yeah. episode, um, <laughs> but I just a couple of, of um, articles, and I found one uh, published of um, Mr. Um, Zacharides, if it's correct. Um, but we will definitely post all the different studies we, we quote or cite um, in the show notes. And um, he and his research group compared these different guidelines. Mm -hmm. And uh, without going too much into detail, the majority of the guidelines were the same, mm -hmm. but they changed like um, some of the contraindications or what kind of exercise are benefit or really advised or mm -hmm. uh, like relatively advised mm -hmm. were a little bit different. But uh, what they all stressed is that you have to really individualize the training prescription. So as with the general health activity guidelines, you have to adjust like what is your pre, especially given the, the pre-pregnancy uh, uh, mm. fitness level. Yeah. So my question to you as a coach, mm -hmm. um, how do you um, do, uh, how do you um, translate or uh, take into consideration this kind of individuality, yeah. especially if you are one-on-one -on -one coaching, I think it's easier, but especially during your online classes, do you always have like, this is for level one, level two, level three, if, and it, it depends uh, what they choose or? Yeah, it's a great question. So my prenatal clients, I prefer to do one-on-one -on -one because every day something can change, like baby could turn, And then she's getting hip pain one day that she didn't have another day. And it really allows me to individualize the program based on where they are at, like fitness wise and activity wise, but also whatever comes up during their pregnancy, whether it's, you know, um, but like um, placenta previa or whether they're having sciatic pain, I can individualize that a lot better in a one-on-one -on -one training session. Um, But yeah, when it comes to the guidelines and the recommendations, they are very, again, very open-ended. And so what we notice with trends with pregnant people in general is that activity levels drop in the first trimester. This is the same for like the average person versus the, the athlete. And that's usually because of the hormone fluctuations. They're feeling more nauseous in the morning, morning sickness. And usually that subsides in the second trimester. So naturally, they're exercise levels drop in the first trimester all, all together and then they increase in the second and they start to taper back off in the third. So being mindful of that, what I do with my clients is regardless of their training history, I, if I have not trained them before, I treat them as a new client. They're brand new. I don't care if I've seen you on TV cleaning <laughs> and jerking this weight. It doesn't matter to me. Our first couple weeks together, I'm getting a sense of like, How much can you lift for five to 10 repetitions? And then I start to build up predicted one rep max charts for them. And then we start to play with, like I said, 50 to 80% of those intensities across their pregnancy. And keeping in mind that lower body exercises significantly get harder because they have extra weight on them anyway. So I'm taking into consideration how much they're weighing, how much their weight changes over their training sessions. Uh, so it's a lot more specialized. It's a lot more work, I would say, in, in the pregnancy stage, but I love it. Then when we get into like the postpartum stage, this is when I basically have a program for when you're four weeks postpartum up until 12, 18 months. Because in Canada, we're very fortunate. We have a maternity leave where you can take six up to 18 months paid. And I mean, it's not much paid, but it's better than nothing. And uh, so most of my clients that I work with are usually between four to six weeks postpartum up to one year and then they go back to work. It's kind of a bad business model because <laughs> the average business takes five years to build up a client base. My longest client was five years because she had three kids. Yeah. So I rely heavily on uh, recruitment and, and referrals uh, from my other clients. But the postpartum uh, period is a lot easier to progress because most people are starting off at no exercise for the last four to eight weeks, right? They've been resting, they've been recovering after their delivery. So basically they're an untrained person. They've still got weight that they're holding on to that they haven't lost because they've gained during their pregnancy. So that's going to impact potential joint issues and things like that. And then their cores are really weak because they've been stretched out over the duration of pregnancy. So when you think about that, okay, you're working with an overweight, 
uh, inactive, untrained, and then uh, potential joint issues, and then also hormone issues, lack of sleep, all these other things that you can add on to it. Um, that's the clients that I work with. And luckily, we don't have to deal with a menstrual cycle. That's like one thing we never have to work around. <laughs> that's, that's episode four of yeah, this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, I, I talked with uh, one, of the, uh, one of the experts um, and a good friend of mine. Um, in episode four about all this menstruational cycle with a lot of <laughs> illustrations. It was the by far longest podcast, more than two hours. Yeah. But it's by far the the the, the episode that was um, viewed or listened to the most. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I just I want to avoid all the hormones. <laughs> like I'm trying. To <laughs> I avoid them. Um, but Overrated. Then, yeah. But then there's there's other hormones like. Uh, You know, prolactin, the breastfeeding hormone, you estrogen, progesterone, those, uh, you know, have increases and decreases that are quite drastic. Sometimes uh, we see postpartum depression, but again, exercise can really help with that. So, yeah, with my clients, uh, again, it's it is very tailored in the prenatal stage, the postpartum stage. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I know what works. My clients come out on the other side and they work hard too. Like they, they're very motivated to get back and, and be fit, but I have to basically be fit to keep up to them. That's the joke that I say. Like everyone's like, oh, you're so fit. I'm like, you should see my clients. Like they're the ones who keep me motivated to like run and, and do all the things. And right now our, um, it's very, it's a unique time. Most of my clients right now, they're, we're doing at least 5K per, five kilometers per stroller class because they're capable. Um, if I had a brand new client who just had a baby six weeks ago or who had a C-section 12 weeks ago, we're not going to be doing that type of running, right? I'm going to suggest they go into one of the more strength-focused programs. But, yeah, everything is, everything is progressive in my programming. Everything's there for a reason. And I tell there's levels, and I'm like, you can, once you do this class and this session, then you can switch to this one or you can do it again and do the harder options. So... I mean, whatever they want to do, I've found now like the program that will fit for them postpartum and prenatal. Like I said, one-on-one -on -one tends to work best just because there's so many changes that can occur. And I want to be able to do the research overnight. So when they come to their next session, I know what they're talking about. I can give them information. I can give them insights on what's happening in their body. So there's, uh, there are uh, many reasons uh, to check out strong her fitness <laughs> it is, is it was the, the website strong her fitness yes yeah, strong her fitness dot ca, .ca. And, and then instagram strong her fitness i don't i have face we have a facebook group but i don't have time for tiktok i don't have time for all the things instagram is the way to find me i need to do my website too but everything's going to be done once my phd is done it's like phd and then all my programs i'm actually going to put up online okay yeah Great. Um, I just have to uh, put another battery, in, battery into my camera. Sure. But beforehand, we can just uh, hear some kind of the ambient noise because it's raining outside uh, quite heavily. Uh, yeah. Let's hear it. And then we start with the next uh, topic. Great. Second battery. <laughs> 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 battery number two <laughs> not not take number two but it's all that's that's uh life yeah um okay so we already um talked about the recommendations the contraindications the difference between the ones and how strong her fitness um takes into account all of these including your personal experience um to give you just a personal idea about uh, i um yesterday evening i talked to my mom Mm -hmm. And um, I talked about this this topic. I was like, tomorrow I will uh, record uh, a podcast about pregnancy with uh, a great uh, researcher and uh, expert in the field. And um, I just wanted to to know how she uh, did exercise, um, especially postpartum. And um, since I was too lazy to turn during pregnancy, <laughs> um, she had like a cesarean. Yeah. Is it the correct yes. word? Yeah. Um, in Germany, it would be the Kaiserschnitt. Okay. <laughs> so with like the, the king's cut. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could say like yeah. weird, weird name, but yeah. uh, she had a cesarean. And um, I asked her if um, in the 90s, I, I'm a 90s <laughs> kid, <laughs> like the 91. And uh, she was like directly like a couple of days, two to three days after her, uh, after um, giving birth. She was um, in a class doing like 
regular fitness, like not heavy lifting, but just, mm -hmm. you know, like a mixture between yoga and so on. Mm -hmm. But due to the cut of her abdominals, she could not get up, especially the first few yeah. things. And she was, and she, she, she really meant it. Um, so the other moms that had not a cesarean, they were like, okay, see you tomorrow. And the, the coach were like, uh, was like, yeah, see you tomorrow. And she was there, <laughs> lying there and couldn't get up yeah. like a lost turtle yeah. um, until the, the um, one person came back and, and, and helped her up. So um, how does your, or what is the, the evidence on the one hand side and your personal experience with the difference between a natural birth, you could say, uh, and having a cesarean for the postpartum um, exercise uh, adventure? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. So a natural birth by definition is a birth that requires no intervention. Okay. So you don't even have like a midwife sweet, like sweeping your cervix or anything. So there's no, any fo no form of intervention. So we categorize births now as vaginal or cesarean, or mm -hmm. some people are, are also calling cesarean sections a belly birth. Mm -hmm. So one or the other. So, um, and within that, there are so many different interventions that you could do or try. Um, so it's very different now. There's a lot more categories. But in regards to kind of, I think, what your main question is, like the recovery time and the difference between, say, a vaginal birth and a, and a C-section or cesarean delivery, uh, it really depends. So I get often asked, how long until I can come back and exercise after I give birth? And I said, well, it'll depend if you have a vaginal or cesarean because cesarean delivery, you're cutting through seven layers of tissue. Then that tissue is getting sewn together. And then now what a lot of people are doing is going to pelvic floor physio to help kind of like that tissue. Uh, they do like different tissue massage techniques in order to allow those uh, layers to not kind of clump when they connect, but, but actually separate and, and almost form individual layers again upon healing. And that can take initially eight to 12 weeks. Uh, but scar tissue itself can take up to two years to fully form. That's why if you had a cesarean delivery and you get pregnant within a year, That your doctor will often encourage you to do another cesarean because if you get too big, you can tear that tissue because it hasn't fully healed yet. But with a vaginal delivery, there has it has its own complications as well. You can still tear during a vaginal delivery. Um, there's different in instruments that can be used, like forceps, that can cause more trauma too, right? So it really depends. Uh, and then with both, you can experience a lot of blood loss, which might impact your return to exercise. Um, With both, you're still growing a human for 10 months. So the weight of the placenta, the amniotic fluid, the, the fetus growing inside you, the hormone changes, the uh, blood pressure changes, all those don't just like go away postpartum. There's a hormone called relaxin that's released systemically in the system. You, as somewhere in the 30 plus week range and it uh, is re released systemically so it affects all joints in the body and when you deliver the baby that hormone is still being released in your system it's still in your system in lower concentrations so you still have the risks of slips and falls and injuries um, and then when you're healing as well some people have a cesarean delivery or vaginal delivery and they feel fine after a month I, have a, I had a client uh, as well this past year that was the case She was like, four weeks after her delivery, she went back to work because she worked uh, in aesthetics. She worked for herself. And I was like, I don't really encourage this, but like, make sure you check with your doctor first. But she healed fine. And then I had another client who ended up at four weeks having a, she got an infection. So then her uh, recovery time ended up taking 16, 18 weeks as opposed to just eight to 12. So it really just depends um, if you have the support at home, getting up and down in and out of bed. That's actually something I teach all my clients because I say, you know, we can prepare and plan all we want, but when you get into the delivery room, anything can happen. And if you have to have a cesarean, you're not going to be able to use your abdominal muscles to get up and down from the floor in and out of bed. So I actually teach them strategies and techniques during our sessions that will allow them to do that safely and not put stress on uh, the scar and the scar tissue. So uh, that's something that we do really have to consider. But again, You could have the perfect uh, pregnancy, perfect delivery, and then have a lot of problems postpartum. It just mm -hmm. totally depends um, on the baby, on, the, on your body, on everything. So for you as a coach, it's, you cannot say that 
uh, clients that got a cesarean are more complicated or for you it's more difficult to, to train them because it's highly, 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 highly individual. Yeah, and, but and it's honestly, it's easier to convince the cesarean section clients to go to pelvic floor physio. Okay, but, so the others, do they say like, no, I don't need this? <laughs> or Yeah, they're like, I feel fine. And I mean, I've had some people who've delivered by cesarean that say, oh, but I didn't, I didn't have a vaginal birth. And I say, no, but you cut through seven layers of tissue. <laughs> and if you were a guy and you had some sort of ab abdominal surgery, you would be going to physio right now. But like, because this is natural or this has been going on for centuries, uh, it's not the case. But then I educate them about, you know, the seven layers of tissue, the risk of infection. And then I, you see people and I say, you know, ask your mom, do, does she have like a scar or your aunt? And like it's kind of all bunched and, and wrinkled. I said, if you don't want that, physiotherapy can really help. So those kinds of things are, are people like, oh, I never would have thought of that. Okay. And it's, it's an easier buy-in. If someone's had a vaginal delivery, feels fine after, and you know, is like, I don't, I feel fine. I don't think I need to go. Oftentimes, they won't. I can, I can try to encourage them as much as I want. But once they start doing my exercise programs, and once they're usually six months in, and we're doing more plyometric works, we're doing jumping and bounding. If they start to experience pelvic floor symptoms, I'm like, well, there's your sign that you, that you need to go. And you can go to physio and be cleared from physio, but then even six months later, have symptoms again because your hormones have changed or because you've stopped breastfeeding, things like that. So it's one of those things like just like an athlete, you've, you've tore your ACL, you did ACL surgery, that ACL is probably going to cause you problems throughout the course of your life. So you do have to maintain a certain amount of strength training. You have to do continue your exercises, right? It's the same with pregnancy and postpartum when it comes to pelvic floor rehab. Yeah, I think having this, um The similarities between athletes training for a competition and like pregnancy being a huge deal and not underestimating the conditions. Uh, I hope <laughs> after saying what, what can happen, cutting through uh, six layers, it, it, um, uh, for me it uh, hears or it, it seems like the, the, the plot of a, a Saw movie. Yeah. <laughs> also. yeah, but I, I actually tell my clients, I said, I, whether you consider yourself an athlete or not, I see you as an athlete and your delivery date is the Olympics. Like, yep. and labor and delivery can last anywhere from six to 36 hours. How are you training for that? And then just like any marathon runner, any athlete who competes at the Olympics, what do they do right after? They rest, as long as they don't have another competition coming up. Why do you rest? Because you need to, right? You need that rest and then you get back into it. And like I tell my clients, you'll have the rest of your life to do whatever you want. You're in a very unique time in your fitness journey. Thank you for trusting me with guiding you through this time. But just know that we're going to get you to wherever you want to be in 12 months. And then you can go do whatever you want. You know, you can, you can go back to CrossFit. You can do V-sits. You can do crunches all day. <clears throat> whatever you want. But for right now, we're very focused on rec like recovery, building up that abdominal strength again, and just making sure that Once you're done, you won't need me anymore. You know, you can go back to your regular coaches, regular classes. That's what I want. That's why it's a terrible business model. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a bad business model, but it works for me. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, to give you just a little bit time to, to, to drink something. <laughs> I think you, you were out uh, last, uh, last every night. night. Every night, every and I'm I'm, t I'm I'm working out. I'm talking to people in the Mensa. I haven't stopped talking and using my voice since I've been here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, what I wanted to, to ask is, um, so as in the, general, um, in the general population, most of the people tend to really do as little as possible or should exercise even more. Um, and since the, the, the pregnancy, like the stretching of the abdominal muscles, the tension on the, on the pelvic floor, um, is such a such a uh, tremendous act um, is it actually um, a problem for those really fit girls like the, the really the crossfit girls with the with the abdominal packs and all um, yeah a lot of muscles is it actually more complicated for them to um, to sustain pregnancy or do you say like no it, it depends it's totally different so if, if you have for example a lot of abdominal muscles 
is it actually a problem for pregnancy? It can be. So um, I believe that most, if not all women, will experience diastasis rectus, abdominis. It's the separation of that linea alba line. Yeah. And you can see it during pregnancy and you can see it with certain exercises. But your abdominal muscles, your abdominal cavity has to stretch, right? And the extent of that stretch is going to be based on, yeah, your musculature, your genetics. A lot of it's genetics. If you want to know how you're going to handle pregnancy, ask your mom how she handled hers, right? Uh, and I mean, you can even look into interviews like Annie Thor's daughter, who's been, you know, 14 time CrossFit Games uh, athlete. She really had a difficult time um, postpartum, and she talks about it openly in interviews. Because you can never predict. You can be the fit, one of the fittest women on earth, and that's not going to matter, right? It's it, because your delivery and your pregnancy can can vary so much. I think the mental block that uh, a lot of these athletes go through is actually probably harder than the physical block. But you do want to take certain precautions, and uh, like you don't necessarily want to be doing crunches or a lot of flexion exercises during pregnancy if you're getting that diastasis. And that's where the breath work comes in, like learning how to breathe properly through exercises, making sure you're not holding your breath. Um, all of that really helps. I, I've seen and I've worked with uh, clients who have separation where you can actually fit like two knuckles deep and even two fingers wide. So they actually have a significant separation. And that's not necessarily the worst thing. Um, what a physiotherapist will tell you even after they deliver and what I check for is there tension? Like, are you able to actually tense your abs? Like, I can sit here and contract my abdominals, mm -hmm. right? Um, but not everyone knows how to do that. And postpartum, it's a lot harder to do that. So it's that retraining, that reprogramming of the mind-body connection that's, that's going to help the most um, when we think about abdominal strength and how that's going to impact not only their activity during pregnancy, but even return to activity and exercise, along with pelvic floor health. Because your diaphragm and your pelvic floor and your core musculature and even like your spinal muscles, they all work together to support your torso. So all of those muscles have to be in a state of continual communication in order to be firing effectively and appropriately. And so that's why the first phase of all of my programs is Pilates and yoga and breathing. It is super <laughs> slow. Some of my clients are like, this is so boring. But when you actually have to think about like, breathing in and out for five seconds each time while lifting through your pelvic floor while pushing on like an unstable sur uh, like unstable surface holding a bird dog you know it actually is a lot to think about and uh and it can be very challenging so it's just it's a step-by-step -step process but yeah i mean i know right now uh tia claire to me she's a, a really predominant crossfit athlete like she was fittest on earth a couple years in a row and she just had a baby so it's been interesting watching and following along with her workouts and exercises. And a lot of people will see that and say, oh, that's not safe. She shouldn't be lifting that. I think, I think it's amazing. My perspective is it's amazing she's still exercising. I'm so happy she's posting so other people can see that they can exercise when they're pregnant. Yeah, she's like the, what, the fit, one of the fittest women on earth. The, the weight she can normally lift, what she's lifting in those videos is nothing in comparison. Right, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Like just because you are not strong enough to lift that weight or that's a super heavy weight for you, that's not necessarily a heavy weight for her. So that's the whole individualized approach. So I try not to judge. Um, I, do, I mean, if someone asks me my opinion, do you, do you think you should be doing muscle ups? I'll say, well, look, if you can see diastasis happening during the muscle ups or things like that, like why not do it strict instead of a swing? You know, why do you have to do butterfly pull ups? Why don't you just do strict pull ups? Like there's so many, substitutions for exercises that I think there's no reason for people to remain stagnant during their pregnancy unless they have a medical condition or unless there's an absolute contraindication. Uh, speaking of contraindications, <clears throat> um, usually in the, in the recommendations you find moderate <clears throat> training, moderate intensity. I personally really like to, to train even at high intensity yeah. and we also um, are working on a systematic review on high intensity interval training in cycling. Mm. Um, what do you think about high intensity training? Is it detrimental for, for performance? Is it uh, a risk? Because I heard like, and you can, you can tell if this uh, is correct or not, the um, heart rate of the uh, unborn infant Is double the is double the the heart rate of the um, the 
pregnant woman. Uh, is it true? And is it a risk to do high intensity training? Yes, that's a good question. So the heart rate of the infant is uh, the fetus is definitely a lot faster, and and that you know varies over the course of pregnancy. And with the guidelines, they do actually list heart rate uh, recommendations for the the mother, and those are really good guidelines because it ranges. You know, the upper end is between like 160 and 165 uh, is the upper end, and the reason it's there is we just don't know what happens at a higher intensity above that. And you should note there's a difference between vigorous intensity exercise and high intensity interval training. Okay, so uh, the Australian guidelines actually recommend moderate intensity and up to vigorous intensity within reason if, if you're able to. And when we look, start to think about athletes, which um, now Margie Davenport at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, who was also a PhD student under Dr. Matola a few years ago, um, they are actually examining and investigating high intensity uh, and more vigorous intensity training with athletes because that is a huge gap in the literature right now. Um, like, what are the upper ends? What are the risks? involved with that because we just don't know so vigorous intensity I say yeah you could you can probably test that I think a lot of CrossFit athletes are working more vigorously than maybe say the average person but they're also they've been training like that their training history it, it would give them more permission to do that if you don't train at that intensity normally is pregnancy the time to start no definitely not like play be on the safe side because you'd never want to risk anything bad happening just to, to work harder. And again, like I said, you have the rest of your life now to train at vigorous intensities. High intensity interval training, there is research and literature done on it in, in, uh, in um, academia right now. But like I said, it's still not as well studied and well documented as other, um, other research. So I think there is a place for it because if you think about interval training, like interval training can be good, but like what intensity are you at during that interval? What's your heart rate at? And I think heart rate is the best means of kind of determining that based on your age. That's what people should be looking at. Track your heart rate while you're exercising. It shouldn't be going too far above that 160 range, especially if you're untrained or if you haven't been exercising as much. And keeping in mind the first trimester, if you're sick a lot, again, you're not exercising, you're not working out, your strength's going to go down. Um, I mean, overall, your mood's probably going down as well. So don't be afraid to start lighter. And then it, as it, you are able to, yes, sure, increase the intensity. But again, keep your heart rate in mind and follow those guidelines as uh, as those are the, those are what we know to be true. Outside of that, we can't re make any recommendations or guarantees at this time that it's going to be safe. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, really necessary to, to, to focus on this even more because... I think in the in the past there was always this oh we have to avoid high intensity training because it can be dangerous and in the recent decades it was like more this okay especially um, with with heart disease uh, things we can we can do this do you know Jenna Waudzia? it's she she's from the University of Alberta okay I guess in the I think it's the she's a, yeah she's probably in our apartment. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, because she might be working in Margie's lab, too, or with Margie's lab. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Davenport, I should say. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah, with yeah. Maggie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, with my um, <laughs> very short, but hopefully intense enough uh, preparation for this <laughs> episode. Um, yesterday, I found one um, um, article. Yeah. Uh, it was accepted on the 25th of April this year. Yeah. So very recent. Very recent. Um, and it was the um, maternal and fetal cardiovascular responses to either acute high intensity interval training and moderate intensity continuous training. Just to give you like a brief overview, mm -hmm. uh, very recent research. Um, they studied 15 women mm -hmm. um, with a singleton pregnancy. Um, and they did one bout of high intensity interval training 10 times, one minute intervals at or above 90% of maximum heart rate mm -hmm. um, with one uh, minute of recovery, which is like, like a high intensity interval training for starters, you could say. Yep. And uh, they compared this to moderate intensity continuous training um, of 30 minutes uh, with, a, with a heart rate of 64 to 76% of maximum heart rate um, at, in random order, two days apart. And what they found is that, to, to give you the, the most important um, parts, the fetal heart rate increased 
during exercise for both conditions, but was not different between the conditions. Mm -hmm. So the fetal heart rate was like plus 40%, uh, plus 40 beats per minute, mm -hmm. plus minus seven for <coughs> the high intensity session. And for the mixed session, moderate intensity continuous training plus 10, no significant difference. Um, and they concluded that an acute bout of high intensity interval exercise consisting of one minute, one minute, um, is well tolerated by both. So they take, took a look at the, um, the blood pressure, pressure and so on. There were no significant differences. Um, but this is just one study, 15 women, just an acute bout, not a chronic mm -hmm. uh, study um, as well. But I think it, it tends to um, maybe weaken the, the fear for like higher intensity. But again, as you said, like, We have to really uh, be aware of, is it really necessary? Yeah. Do we really need to have like the most efficient or most effective uh, training? Yeah, and I mean, that lab is great because they're, this is what they're focused on right now. So you're going to see a lot more research coming out in, in the field. So it's definitely going to contribute to the literature. I know there was um, a study released out uh, from a group in Australia. Forner uh, was uh, one of the main authors, and this was just uh, last year, two years ago. Um, but they were just, they basically surveyed uh, pregnant people and asked them, you know, what did they do during their pregnancy? How heavy were they lifting? Did they use a lifting belt? Did they use, do or perform the Valsalva maneuver? And it was actually really interesting to read the results um, because a lot of people continue to exercise. And a lot of their, their sample was more CrossFit athletes too. So you're going to <laughs> anticipate that. But what people need to keep in mind too is what stage of pregnancy are you doing these things in? Right. So this is what is not really um, it's not really uh, accounted for in many of the studies. And I know this because working in the lab, we have a very short window to recruit participants. So we usually get people from, you know, 12 to 18, up to 20 weeks where we can get them in. Most people don't tell you they're pregnant until the first trimester is over. Right. So what are people doing in the first trimester? Well, if you don't know you're pregnant, which is sometimes the case. You're doing whatever you normally do. You're doing CrossFit. You're using a weightlifting belt. You're doing bench press on your back. You know, you're, you're doing plyometrics. You're probably not doing those things in the third trimester. So always when you're looking at, and I, I've started to notice this and kind of put my magnifying glass on the research <laughs> with this, like where are people at in their pregnancies when they're enrolled in the study and when they're doing these exercises and activities? Because you can say, oh, Well, all these people did it, so it must be safe to, to perform the Valsalva maneuver. There was no negative complications or implications to that. Well, yeah, they were all doing it in the first trimester. I would never recommend that in the third trimester, right? You don't want to you know, put any tension and, and constrict the abdominal muscle or uh, thoracic cavity during that time. So that's one thing I will say looking at the literature and, and kind of being in the field. And, and what I recommend to other people is, Look at what trimester they're doing it. And if it's not listed, again, there's a gap in, in the research right there that could be potentially investigated. Um, what is your field of research or what is uh, what? How does your thesis when you uh, submit it uh, in the hopefully yeah. this year? Yes, uh, it, uh, not hopefully. <laughs> it's going. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going it's, in. It's going to happen. Yes. Um, and what is your yeah, like um, uh additional uh, value, your added value of your thesis, what is a newly um, known in the, in the field of pregnancy and so on. Yeah, so my dissertation and my studies focused on exercise during the postpartum period. So my first study looks at, can we improve adherence and participation in a postpartum exercise intervention? Um, if the exercises are supervised, we have it in a group setting. And then if we also offer child care, and child mining in the sessions. And we also include the infants in the exercises. So we ran um, a 10 week exercise intervention. We had uh, three groups that were enrolled in the study over the course of uh, a year and a half, two years. And what we found is that compared to the literature, our adherence rates are through the roof. We only had like a 10% dropout. And most of the people who dropped, half of the people who dropped out, dropped out even before the intervention began. So it was like some sort of extenuating circumstance. Um, and then the rest of the participants, we had 78% adherence, 
which is unheard of with, with this group. It was very, very good. And that was attending 70% of the classes or more. And we even had uh, a couple of participants who attended all of the classes, all 20 classes, because we were training twice a week. Uh, we did, we used the strollers. Uh, the participants could bring their infants or they could bring light dumbbells, like a set of fives, whatever equated to the weight of their baby or less, they could bring to the exercise intervention. Uh, they brought their own yoga mats and their towels. And then we would start with a warm up with our strollers. Uh, we'd set up the mats, we'd do a short circuit, then we'd do some light jogging, some arm exercises, and we ended up doing like three circuits uh, with jogging in between and some isolation exercises for the arms and the shoulders. And then over the weeks, we gradually increased the volume of running and the intensity, and we decreased the rest time between circuits. The circuits got longer, so we were doing Tabatas, we were doing AMRAPs, we were doing EMOMs, we, did, we were doing them all. Um, and then um, that was like, so that was like, okay, can, can we improve ad adherence? And statistically looking at the numbers, the most common reason for people not to attend was weather. Because in Canada, one day we had a snowstorm and basically no one attended class the next day. Um, or uh, appointments, so with doctors or physicians that they can't miss or life events. So realistically, I was like, well, those are all really good reasons for not for not coming to an exercise session. Um, then the second part of the study is what was the effect of the 10 week intervention on the group? So starting from start to finish, we uh, tested them at baseline. We tested them midway through the intervention and then we tested them at the end on a variety of different factors, both qualitative and quantitative, uh, but mostly looking at weight loss, BMI. Uh, we looked at body fat uh, percentage and patterning as well. Uh, and then we did strength assessments. So we had a push-up assessment. We had a body weight squat. We had a plank hold assessment. And then we took metrics like physical activity levels, self-reported, so very subjective. Um, but we looked at infant activity as well over the intervention. And then... Um, the third and then to see if there was changes and there were improvements across the intervention uh, which was nice to see but uh, the one problem we face now with COVID is like I wanted to do um, a control arm and we were unable to do that this was a pilot study we had never tested the hypothesis of this type of an intervention and so right before COVID was when we were going to start enroll and actually have a waitlist control so put people on a waitlist have them in the control group, and then we'd enroll them in the program after. So that didn't happen. So then my third study became, uh, are there differences uh, or essentially, is it better to start an exercise intervention earlier or later? Or do we see the same changes across the board or is it different? And basically, the earlier that we can get people active after they've had their baby, the better. The curves look the exact same across the board. Everything pretty much looks the exact same, but the people who started earlier uh, ended up finishing the intervention, you know, at a lower body rate compared to the kind of like postpartum age uh, who enrolled at that weight who started higher. So essentially the exercise intervention, it worked, uh, obviously within reason, because we need a control group to really test the efficacy. But uh, yeah, and then during it between the groups, it's uh, the earlier we can start, the better. But even if even if you're starting later, you just have to start. If you can do it, do it. Okay, so there's no doubt that starting exercising to the extent you can and in uh, relation to what you've you've done so far uh, is a general rule yeah so you have to get out exercise yeah. at best in a in a variety of different things yeah. and uh, depending on what you what you can and what you cannot do or what you like to do yeah and yeah and, and i mean our, our intervention we we only had a track and a gymnasium space We had babies as weights. We had light dumbbells, <laughs> strollers, a yoga mat, and benches and stairs. That's all we had. We didn't have fancy equipment. So the whole purpose was, do you need a lot of fancy equipment in order to get these results? No, you don't. You can literally go outside, find a park bench, and do a workout there. You can stay at home with your baby. You can use a chair. You can use a couch. All of these things are easily accessible. We wanted to basically make it as transferable as possible. And so back to my point of like why I wanted to go back, I wanted to make sure that whatever I did, I could directly apply and people could hear about it. It would make sense. And 
it informs what I do in my classes for my business. Like everything I do is informed by the literature and informed by running this type of an intervention and seeing how the, like the positive impact it's had. And so now even in my business, I have two fourth year kinesiology interns from the university that work with me from September until April. And then I also get a co-op student from the college. And so they're there during the classes, they assist with infants uh, and they sometimes even lead classes as well. And my participants tell me, if it wasn't for them, sometimes I wouldn't be able to show up because I know that even if I've had a bad night, I haven't slept, I have help in the class that I can say, hey, can you feed my infant with their bottle while I do the circuit? And that's their job. And it, it really has just, it, 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 we've made a very cool culture and community based around that. And again, for informing future literature, a lot of the research in the past doesn't include infants in the exercises. but. As a new mom, you you have to take your infant everywhere. So we should start really thinking about that when we're creating these protocols and when we're thinking about how do we incorporate babies into exercise. It's such a it's such a field that is still again growing and again a place for future research. <laughs> <laughs> I'm given lots of ideas here. If anyone wants to study pre and postnatal, there's a lot of holes in the literature. There are a lot of PhDs that can be, can yeah, be done in, yeah, in this field. Maybe right here. Um, <laughs> In the, we are coming to the end of the of this episode, but I wanted to ask you, um, how does it go on for you? So you have your own business. I think you are about to to do this uh, as long as you yeah. <laughs> as, it, as it takes you. But um, there's, I think, at the end of in the end of the PhD, it's always this question: Do you want to stay at the university uh, part time? Because I know. Uh, especially here uh, at the German Sport University, you really like to teach. You work as a professor. Yeah. Um, you like to teach um, uh, general classes, like here, um, training with special populations or uh, in, under certain conditions. Do you want to stay there? Do you have a perspective? Or is it as complicated as here in Germany that uh, fixed positions are uh, hard to get? Um, yeah. Yeah. How, do, how does Stephanie Paplinski go on? <laughs> Aside her business. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I love my business and it's been it's been wonderful. Um, I, I do see my business closing like I'm probably going to close it in the next three to five years um, to focus more on academia. But I personally don't want to teach full time at one institution. And I'll tell you why. So when I'm here, I get to teach all the Erasmus students and I teach a course called Exercise for Special Populations. And it goes over two weeks. And so they learn about pre postnatal kids and children, youth and adolescents, and then older adults and uh, people with obesity. And the number one um, feedback I get from all of the students is, I wish we spent more time on pre and postnatal because we don't offer a course like that at our university. And I love this area so much. So my goal is actually to teach one course or maybe two on exercise and the impact of exercise, physical activity, lifestyle interventions during and after pregnancy on maternal and infant health, but I want to teach it at multiple universities online. So my students are, are great resources for that because they're connected to these universities. Here I'm hoping to potentially pitch the course and pilot the course here because, I mean, if you're going to do this type of a course, this is the best place to do it. So I've been speaking with the international office and fingers crossed. I'm putting it out there so maybe it will happen one day, but I do, I, I like being an entrepreneur. I like having the business and if I didn't have my business and my clientele, I wouldn't have been able to kind of figure out some of these gaps that I'd already been seeing and hearing about in order to help inform ideas for literature. And now the literature has helped me realize, okay, what was I missing with my clients and, and helping to fill those gaps in. So I'm only one person and the more people I can help to educate and inform about pregnancy and the, and the benefits of exercise during a pregnancy, I think it's a trickle down effect. So that's the goal is to teach and educate um, in, in person, through seminars, going to CrossFit uh, gyms and, and running workshops and, and seminars in that regard, presenting at conferences. But I don't want to be full time at an institution. I'm happy to even give research ideas because there's so many out there. But I will probably be starting a podcast episode probably in the next two years, too, because knowledge translation is a big thing. I read the literature pretty much every week. I'm reading new articles. And so basically I want to start a podcast 
that is basically breaking down those articles in layman's terms. So you can listen to my podcast for 30 minutes a day. You'll get a breakdown of all the research and literature in the specific area. And then you can make informed decisions if you're a physician, if you're a person, you know, working out or becoming pregnant, if you're the partner of a person working out or who's pregnant, then it, you can then speak to them like you know what you're talking about because I'm going to tell you the basics of it. So that's those are the the big goals long term. Nice. So we we are you're just starting in, this in, yeah. in podcast. I know yeah. I'm going to need all yeah. your tips and a list of everything you bought. I'm just going to copy copy your setup because it you, looks great. Well, you're welcome <laughs> to ask me anything about mics, lights. Uh, yeah. I'm not a professional, but I do this with all I I can and uh, listen to various tutorials. So yeah. feel free to, to To, to yeah, to, yeah. to call me at any time. Maybe you'll be a guest on my podcast one day if you want. I, yeah. I, if you um, if you send me an invitation, absolutely, I, can, I will definitely be there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> have like a cross yeah. <laughs> crossover episode. Yeah. Um, and luckily for you, um, we have like a, a, a special master program. Mm -hmm. So it's an additional master program, not a con conventional master program called. Um, Yeah, uh, sport physio uh, physiotherapy, mm -hmm. and I'm responsible now for the for the exercise science part, which is yeah, you could say one quarter of the mm -hmm. of the whole study, and we are currently readjusting like what can be renewed. And um, a colleague of mine, which I had a podcast uh, episode with, um, we want to more focus on different topics like, um, for example, menstruational cycle and this. And uh, we should definitely have a chat about how you could implement uh, your knowledge, if you mm -hmm. want, um, in this kind of master's uh, yeah. program. Yeah, because I think, um, especially for, for practitioners mm -hmm. in an academia setting, it's good for, uh, for them to have like, uh, a scientist that, can, that also knows what it is related or how it translates to to use barbells or dumbbells instead of barbells mm -hmm. and so on. So the so the practical details. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, I think it was really nice having you here yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> in the podcast. And uh, yeah, it was um, a really interesting topic, but you are so an interesting person. Uh, <laughs> it was a really, um, yeah, a huge deal for me. Um, yeah, this was the first uh, podcast episode outside yeah. with <laughs> some ambient noise. And I think we managed it quite well, uh, even though there was uh, a lot of rain. I hope everything um, was understood. Thank you very much for being here uh, at the podcast. Um, the next episode will uh, be in German again. Uh, I will talk with Timo Sievenich uh, from um, a very special and new um, startup called Oda Kova, which is the backwards uh, of avocado yeah <laughs> yeah um, and they uh, created an artificial intelligence that helps you to um, have like nutrition guidelines or for example if you type in i'm a vegetarian and i exercise mm -hmm. uh, in this in that uh, regard then the ai gives you like okay here you have this kind of Very cool. um um, idea and this kind of cereals so um, the nutritional part uh, will t t take on um, I wish you all the best for yes. for your time here <laughs> and yeah it thank was you very for nice having me it's always yeah. great to be back it's always great catching up so when you have your next guest though ask if they have anything for pregnancy programmed in the AI yeah I, I will I <laughs> yeah. will ask for this uh, I, I will take this this yeah. uh, question yeah. and uh, um, ask uh, uh, Timo um, yeah <laughs> this was the exercise inside out podcast episode 14 my name is Oliver Quittmann Stephanie Poplinski was here We had a great time. See you in the next episode. Bye. Ciao.